Biobalance HealthCast episode 224, Lost Libido is Restored with Testosterone Replacement. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast. I'm Brett Newcomb and this is Dr. Kathy Maupin. And this week we're going to be talking about libido uh, and mm-hmm. sex once again. <laughs> and people sometimes say, well, you talk about that an awful lot. It is a significant reality in all of our lives, whatever our sexual drives are and our opportunities for satisfaction of those drives. And so we have to talk about the physiological aspects of that, the emotional and relational aspects of that. I spent 30 years teaching other people how to be therapists, teaching clinical skills. And one of the things that we had to learn to talk about with anybody were things sexual. And I had to teach my students about how do you approach those conversations without uh, proselytizing your own viewpoint or proselytizing your message or or being shocked or reactive or disturbed because people need to be able in that trusting environment to talk about those specific details. And so one of the things that I taught them to look for is the emotional feel of the conversation. If it was prurient or titillating, there's an energy in the room that's off-putting. If it's inquisitive or painful, the energy level is different. And so what I would teach my students to to try to focus on is is how to stay in the conversation to hear what the concern was and to talk about what the problem was. And our entire focus was on emotional relational. Over the years, one of the things that I have learned, which was a huge deficit in my training, uh, that there was just so much ignorance there, was I didn't know the physiological piece. And actually, in in an earlier podcast, I I shared about this middle-aged woman who came to see me who had lost her sex drive. She'd had a stroke, and as she healed from the stroke, it, it was gone. And she'd been to neurologists, and she'd been to therapists, and she'd been to priests, and and she said, I just don't want it, and I can't have any satisfaction. I I can never achieve orgasm if I try to go there. It's just dead for me. And that really bothers me. I want it back. Can you help me? And I was not able to help her because 30 years ago, I didn't have the information that I have to do today that comes directly from working with Dr. Maupin and what she has taught me about the importance of testosterone and testosterone levels uh, to the the creation, the generation, the satisfaction, the experience of our libido. So today we're going to look at real patients who have come to Dr. Maupin and been treated by her. We're going to look at the things they have to say in a non-prurient, non-titillating way to say, how do you problem solve the problem and how do you understand the physical and the relational components? And I wish I had attended your class because in medical school, we were not trained to talk about sex. And so I have to say that for the first, I don't know, when I started doing GYN and I had this subject come up, yeah. I stuttered the whole time because I it's, did, did, it's really didn't awkward. know what to say. You know, I, I was like, I, I was making the patients laugh. Yeah. I mean, because I was having problems broaching the subject. However, after 29 years of that, right. of talking to you women learn. and talking to men and doing infertility yeah. and talking to couples about their sex lives, then it becomes normal conversation. And even my um, in my household, I've been criticized for talking too much about that because that's what I talk to people on the phone about. And there are other people listening sometimes, even though I'd walk out of the room. But having said that, it shouldn't be a subject that is ignored in relationships or in aging. Right. We, should, we shouldn't we should think this is something that we should give up because what you'll hear in these excerpts from my patients is this is a huge part of their life. Sex is huge and testosterone is what gives us the ability to have the desire to have sex and to have sex and to have orgasms. So testosterone is the key hormone. If you don't have testosterone in general, you're not going to have a sex drive or a sex life. And therefore, replacing testosterone is the key to getting all of this back in most people. So that's what we'd like to show you from the point of view of our patients. I did not have a lot of the usual symptoms, no hot flashes, no headaches, no problems sleeping, but I had dryness and lack of libido, low libido, yes. And so... um, 
I didn't even think about it really being related to the hormone issue. So as you can see from what this patient had to say, she is not aware uh, in her life that these things are connected, that the libido and the loss of libido can be a, a real medical thing. A real hormonal a thing. A real hormonal thing. Uh, she talked about another symptom, dry vagina, uh, or dryness being painful as a reason to perhaps avoid a sexual situation. Uh, but people in our culture don't know this. They don't have, they're not taught it anywhere. It's not taught in sex ed in school uh, because of the in school, sex ed is all about what do you do and when do you begin and how do you avoid pregnancy or, or whatever. It isn't like a lifetime survey uh, of sex. And, and you try to have conversations. I try to have conversations with people who are that sandwich generation mm -hmm. and they're worried about their elderly Which is what parents. age is now? Oh, the sandwich generation. The sandwich generation. Excuse yeah, me. it's like they've got, they're raising teenagers. What do I tell my teenager mm -hmm. uh, about sex? And then how do I deal with my grandmother being sexually active at the nursing home? Uh, yeah. Or is she, or if she wants That's to be, or dirty old men, you know, who still have some drive, but nobody. But they do. don't have a partner. So we're not taught about this stuff, and we're especially not taught about the hormonal element of it. The key, the key, to me is we've made this a social. We have a social judgment about sex instead of saying this is a physiologic, this is a hormonal issue. If it is not about really the person you are, that has to do with what you do with your desire. That has right. to do with what you do with your sexuality. That, of course, is personality. Right. But it is not a psychiatric issue. This is, is actually put Although into were, the realm. You were saying the loss of libido in the medical studies that right. you've had is always listed under mental health. That's right. You're supposed to Not send people hormone. to a psychiatrist if right. they have a problem with their libido or loss of libido. And yes, it does it does cause other problems because right. in relationships, marriages, and, and partnerships, yes. and it gets very complicated. But it starts out as being an endocrine problem, a hormonal problem, or a GYN problem, but it's not even listed under that as, as a, a medical issue. It is a psychiatric issue, and I don't believe that. Well, in our previous podcast, we talked about the ebb and flow of insulin and the way mood and physiology responds to how that cycles. But we don't do the same thing about sex no, because we, we don't have the same information. Everybody kind of knows a little bit about insulin and the changes mm -hmm. in diabetes and stuff, but they don't know about the loss of testosterone as we age and thereby the loss of libido. It's so subtle it just drifts away. And, and it can people, be treated. People are confused. I mean, everybody thinks, oh, well, that's gone. Or I, I, I am missing a piece, so I... I'm no, broken in some I'm way, broken. or I'm old and it's gone, I can't get it back, oh well. It right. sure was nice when I had it. But that's not true. Yeah. So, so, it doesn't so have to be true. It doesn't have there is to be true. A treatment. And that's our, that's our job here today, is so that everyone knows that, so that they don't feel hopeless. There were some problems with intimacy with my husband, and he couldn't understand what was going on with me. And I kept trying to explain to him that there was something that a woman's body goes through as she ages and that I had to find some form of something that was going to help with that. And I went through some of the problems that I was having, that it was painful um, because of dryness issues, etc. And at some point, I don't think he really understood what I was going through. And he got kind of irritated with me. Once I found Dr. Maupin, and I started doing the procedures, he's going, what changed? I said, Dr. Maupin helping me, Dr. Maupin. And there's been times where, because our insurance does not cover this process, that, you know, we've got other things going on, we've got family that needs money, and he's going, I don't know how we're going to be able to afford it. We'll figure it out, however, because you need this. <laughs> So this patient helps us move into a larger discussion because she raises a couple of ancillary issues to the hormone fluctuation and the way it feels. Uh, and, and she talks about the importance of money and being able to pay for the treatment. And she talks about the relationship, uh, what was happening to the relationship as her hormones declined and her libido went away and what was happening when she got them replaced and it came back and her husband says, what changed? <laughs> right. I mean, she didn't, she on purpose didn't want to let him in on this. Right. And I have several patients that do that, that, that say, 
mm, I'm not going to tell him what I'm doing until it comes out really good because I just want to see what he'll say. I want to see if he'll notice. Right. And 100% of the time, they notice. And they, but they, they don't say, know but they don't know what it, it is. Well, yeah. They're like, mm, what it, what's different? What happened? Because now everything's better, but how did that happen? And so, so Teresa... Says, I've had patients of yours she came to see that me. I worked with, yes, who came in and said, I thought she was having an affair because she wasn't interested in me. She wouldn't respond to mm -hmm. me. She didn't She didn't react the way I knew her to react before. So I thought something was broken. She was either mad at me uh, mm -hmm. and we were in trouble or mm -hmm. she had found somebody else and I was in trouble. Uh, and now she's back, so I assume she got over it. Yeah. But but they know. I mean, usually after the fact, my patients tell their share. Husband, yeah, share. They tell yeah. their husbands. Hmm. And and usually years down the line, then their husbands start having little issues mm -hmm. as they get older. And so then I, I get to meet them, <laughs> and then they come in for treatment as well. But but in this case, um, this I know this patient very well, and she's she's been seeing me for years. She's delightful, and she has a delightful husband, and um, I, not as a patient, but I just I've met him right. and, uh, socially, and so we we've had nice discussions about the fact that ha this is so important to their relationship, and and having the pellets is so important to her and her own her career. It gives her not only sex drive but motivation and energy, and and makes her uh, there's so many other things that it does for her, but. The primary reason she came in was to fix her marriage and yeah. to fix her, her libido. And honestly, if we could do a lot of good if everyone who was at this age and who had a testosterone deficiency could actually be treated and actually get better, in that way we would save a lot of relationships. Well, and there's validation to the point that an active and happy sexual life, uh, sense of sexual self, mm -hmm. is important to all of us and to our relationships. This patient says it was. It is so important to us that we will even pay out of pocket, that we will scramble mm -hmm. around and find the money, because my husband says it's important. And I uh -huh. say it's important. And so we make this a priority. And nowadays, mm -hmm. it is actually any hormones, like if you get to the point where women need hormones, right. if you're doing bioidentical and they're not paid for by insurance, then it ends up being a wash right. with that. Right. So you're either paying it to the pharmacy and getting something that's not quite as good as this. Well, yeah, Viagra is like, what, $15 a pill? Yeah, and or 20 depending on which 20, pharmacy. Depending on which pharmacy you go to. But we're so. talking about men. Now we're talking about men again. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but for but for women, but men will find the money for it. Well, that's true. And women will sometimes say, "Well, you know, I'm not worthy, or it's not important enough, or maybe I'm, you know, for me." But when they find out it's important to the husband, then they're willing to say, "Okay, we can do this." That's right. And their husbands are backing them for this. And for this, will. Yeah. yeah. I had just newly been remarried, and I just sort of felt like what a ripoff for the husband. <laughs> <laughs> to marry this woman and then she suddenly starts going into menopause. So, um, no, I don't even think it was anything that he noticed, but I noticed it. I could tell stuff was happening. And so it was the perfect time for me to run into this woman who gave me all this information. I thought, wow, awesome. So this patient speaks to the issue of self-awareness and self-perception. She had recently married and she didn't feel like her libido was where it ought to be for him to get what she wanted him to get out of the marriage. Well, they were dating, and it was there, and then they they get married, and then it's kind of that bait and switch. But it's and that's what a lot of guys think has happened. It's bait and switch. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the oldest jokes I've known is what kills sex drive in women: wedding cake. Yeah, you know, I know, and, sadly. And so, but, that, but, but the reality is, it's that's not what it is. It's no, testosterone. It's, it is not what it is or, in this or case. It's relational. Which brings mm -hmm. me to my bailiwick, the ability to talk to your partner mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling this way about my desire level and what I know about it. Can I share that with you? Are you recognizing it? Is it something that we can manage ourselves by talking and changing what we do? Or is it something that we need to go see a doctor about? That's that's the, hard, that's the hardest thing. It's but, so hard. But in this case, she's adorable, looks 
20 years younger than she is and and so is he and they're they so they have all this they had all this sexual energy and then all of a sudden nothing and she that, recognized and she, it, it was, was concern her concern see, yes not his concern right it was her concern and discovered it yet and it, well you know she she realized it and she went oh no this is not what I know he bargained for, and it's not what I bargained for. So we need something more out of life. And that is, that's what testosterone gives you back. Right. And that's what more she... More out of life. She, more out of life. And so she wanted more out of this marriage, and, and she got it. And I'm ecstatic about that. Apparently so is she. Yeah. I have a husband who travels all week, so maybe I lucked out. You know, he'd be gone all week. Um... But then there would be the time, okay, he came home. And um, for me, you know, I would want to have sex now before I'd be like, are you kidding me? I know you're home, but, you know, I wanted it on Tuesday and you weren't here. And that would be the joke between us. But um, now I have no problem. I mean, he, I would say, I, I do think, I don't think I've ever had really a libido, if I, I think back, maybe in high school. <laughs> but um, it definitely, I mean, I think that's been a huge part of our relationship. Definitely brought us closer together. I know he's happier. I'm happier. So um, I think that that lends for, a, you know, a really great marriage. I love it when she says, I've never really had much of a sexual desire. And then she laughs and says, well, maybe in high school. Mm -hmm. To me, the, now knowing what I've learned from you mm -hmm. is the message that she may not have had adequate levels of testosterone her entire life. That's uh, true. If she now has a sex drive, that she's really excited about and happy about, mm -hmm. and she recognizes that she lived in a vacuum sexually mm -hmm. uh, in terms of having libido. It may have been there all of her life. Well, I've ta you know, we've talked about this before that just like everything else, there's a bell curve, basically a bell curve of all the people's testosterone levels. Right. Some people have an excessive amount when they're younger and up right. to the age of 40, and some people have not enough. And and I run into this a lot. Women who come in for other reasons, not usually sex drive. They come in for testosterone and estrogen replacement because of other symptoms. And then we give them their testosterone and they go, well, I've, I've never had enough testosterone. Clearly I've never had enough because now I feel like I'm normal. I have a normal sex drive. And, and now my husband's like, wow, you know, where did this come from? And happily, not in, I've never had free one mass, of them, free free, <laughs> one of them say, oh yeah, yeah, drop it back down. Yeah. No, I yeah, mean, it's, back, I'm but then except they, that some guys are threatened by that when that starts to happen. And the and the the that's true. partner becomes more demanding, more desiring, more assertive than they are used to. Then they begin to worry about their own performance. And when guys start to worry about performance, performance tends to decline. Right, but we so, deal, we take care of that too. So well, usually they bring their absolutely you bring to them me. in. Yeah, we bring them in. But or you send them to a counselor to say, yeah. hey, how are you going to talk about this? What are you going to do? Or I just tell I tell the wives that it's stage fright and they need to not be act you know not be it's harassing your, their husbands about this because don't it's not making it them yeah don't that, that's the worst thing they can do now that they have their sex drive back they want to have a, a functional partner right. so being loving and kind is always a good idea and not being judgmental so so in this case in this case that has nothing to do with this patient she's no, she's, we, it, she's delightful a lot of our comments don't have anything yeah. specific patients yeah this is she's delightful and um because of her recognition of her own sexuality, I love that. I mean, I think that is something that uh, we all should be able to recognize at some time in our life. Uh, the other thing is, maybe she had a normal sex drive, and then when when we uh, start to be sexually active or get married, whichever comes first, then we go on birth control, and birth control pills shut down our testosterone. So oftentimes, we're shutting down our own sex drive throughout our life, and that happens after high school, right. usually. And then we don't really realize what we've been shutting down until we get it back in replacement. And so the pellets do that. So it could it could be either. It's so sad to wait till postmenopausal or middle age or older age to get that back. Better late than never. Amen. <laughs> In regard to my libido, which is huge for me, I was not particularly interested in sex. And I'm not like a sexual animal, but I am very affectionate and I enjoy having sex with my partner. And so I was like, well, that's weird. 
and that's way wrong because it was missing a huge component of his and mine relationship and that felt disconnected like I was disconnecting from him and seemingly the rest of the world and I didn't know I felt like I was falling off that cliff and kind of scrambling to get back to where I was I noticed that there was a drop in uh, intimacy and it we are very active and uh, suddenly it was for example instead of every day it was once a week maybe and that again you know that throws a flag in the air something's not right here and, and I started to pay a lot of attention to um, either suggestions that were ignored or um, things that we would normally do that there was no real interest there but again after the the pellet therapy began um, that rolled right back to normal just um, very quickly so Dr. Mappa, one of the things that I get that strikes me the most in this last vignette that we've watched this couple is when the man says the the things that we would normally do we weren't doing and the cueing the signaling the that flirting we which is another word do, wasn't flirting. working mm -hmm. and I I see that all the time mm -hmm. in the conversations that I have with people their couples develop signaling you have kids, you work, mm -hmm. you, you whatever, you, you, you have to have a secret. You find little message. ways to communicate that mm -hmm. I'm interested, you know. You brush uh, your teeth Marcus before you go willing. to bed. Yeah, which, <laughs> which you don't normally do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just but joking. But we, we do all develop signals and cues, and then when those fall flat and they're not perceived or responded to, it's very distressful. And mm -hmm. it creates a lot of uh, adaptive responses, most of which are negative in the yeah. relationship. Mm -hmm. So this couple was able to recognize it and come in and do something about it in a mm -hmm. positive way with really good results. And they're yeah. very happy. They're very happy and they're yeah. back to their normal frequency and they're back to their normal and the signals cueing work. and the signals work and, <laughs> yeah. and everybody's happy which is exact. I mean that That's just your goal. that makes me feel so good when they come in and say it's all better now and and we're back to our old selves. Yes. That's what I'm looking for and, and we can all be back to our old selves. My husband believes in these so much that he works in construction. So on the lunch break, you know how the guys gather around and talk and they talk about their wives, how, you know, oh, you know, my wife doesn't want to have sex or, you know, my wife's griping all the time and she's not the same person. My husband pipes right up and says, I don't have that problem. And they make fun of him sometimes because they'll say, there is no way that you can have sex whenever you want it. And he says, yes, I can. I'm telling you, my wife is on these pellets. And um, so then these guys get really interested in this. And I mean, he has their full attention, you know, at lunchtime. And a couple of them have come to him and said, thanks. Uh, I think you saved our marriage. And they've gotten on the pellets. I don't know if they've necessarily come here because I, I don't know what their last name is. I only know them by their first name. It's possible they could because he does give Dr. Maupin's name to him and he's even actually come home and said you got any more of her cards so I've I've given some cards away to my husband to take to work. I love the excitement and the energy in this woman Yeah, I and, know. and I love her I story know. you know there are so many people that come out of your office smiling and say ask me why I'm happy <laughs> and they're glad right. to share the news and and mm -hmm. her husband is happy and glad to share the news and this doesn't happen for everybody but it happens for a significant number of people. I go sit in the waiting room just to listen and it's talk fun. to them. We I, kind of have group sessions in the waiting room when, I, when I've when i had somebody cancel or I don't have somebody scheduled. So. The, the difference of sitting in the waiting room at your office versus sitting in the waiting room at my office is so hysterically <laughs> obvious. When, when you go to a mental health office and people are sitting there, they're kind of glancing at each other like, yeah. are you, a, a, you know, what are you here for? What are you here for? <laughs> <laughs> when you come to your office, people are telling their stories. It's like, oh my God, this happened to me, and I'm so much better, and this my husband. Like, that I, doesn't I mean, happen in my office. Yeah, there's some. I mean, there are some that it's just like too much information. Yeah, you know, but everybody's laughing about it because they're all in the same situation. They're all in the same, except for the new patients, right. but. At least they get they're hope. They're learning. They they're, get so hope. They're learning. Like, okay, this might work. That's right. So, so when everyone's talking about this, it's like they have a little club. They all know, they all know what each other is doing. That they're healthier. They're they're better. They're having sex. They're no longer feeling old. I mean, yeah, if, if they all are it, in the same group. If you've made it through this whole podcast, 
<laughs> You've seen multiple stories of people whose lives were improved for the better and who are happier because their libido is back and alive and satisfying. So if that's a concern or an issue in your life, read our book, find your way to the website, find a, a physician, preferably Dr. Maupin if you can get to her, <laughs> who, who does uh, replace testosterone with pellets. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.